Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Kate Perpetua for having me today. Um, I'm pretty excited about speaking um, about killer whales along the Oregon coast in California, about their behavioral ecology. Um, I know it's been kind of a, a new topic for the last couple of years as uh, a lot of people are starting to see more and more killer whales. And um, it, we were very excited as our research team has been, been working hard with the Oregon community to try to better understand them. Uh, so, um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a research scientist with uh, the University of British Columbia, the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries, um, the Marine Mammal Research Unit, but I'm also um, a research associate with the Pacific Wildlife Foundation, and as well as um, a leader with the uh, lead researcher with the Oceanic Eco um, Ecology Research Group. Uh, so just a little background, um, I spent uh, since the early 2000s working with killer whales, um, in particular I grew up on southern Vancouver Island. Uh, where I spent most of my time in Puget Sound area, as well as the Salish Sea, working on trying to better understand uh, tr the transient mammal-eating killer whale form, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but I also studied resident killer whales um, and offshore killer whales, and uh, it's been kind of a, a life goal to kind of follow these animals and, and try to better understand them. Um, so just kind of a general overview. Um, there's three ecotypes. Now, an ecotype is a genetically distinct population or um, basically it's a, it's, a, it's a fancy term scientists give to an animal that they really don't know what's going on. So one species of killer whale is known globally, but we have multiple populations that are kind of distinct. Um, for instance, here we have um, three ecotypes in the Northeastern Pacific that are all genetically distinct as well as acoustically and even morphologically. Uh, so you can see on the far left here, this is a what we call the resident killer whale. Um, we know two different populations, a northern resident as well as a southern resident population. They, they predominantly eat salmon, um, other fish species as well. Um, they live in groups of between five to 50 animals. Um, the killer whales are also based on this matrilineal system where it's a female and her, her offspring. Um, and resident killer whale society is really strong when it comes to that that. Um, that be that the matriarchal uh, where there's no dispersal of male or female offspring uh, and we see these animals particularly the northern resident killer whales uh, anywhere from the middle of vancouver island up to southeast alaska and then we also have uh, the southern residents which we we see from basically the salish sea southern vancouver island southern british columbia all the way down to southern uh, down to central california and off the oregon coast um there we're starting to see more and more reports of southern residents um, especially out in the fishing banks um, our research team um, has been picking up a lot of sightings of southern residents out there and particularly one of the new calves in um, one of the three pods k pod uh, so there's j k and l which are all part of the southern residents um, and one new calf was actually identified off oregon Oregon for the first time in the summer, which was pretty exciting. Um, the population I really spend a lot of my time, though, is understanding is the transient. Um, you can see here uh, the, the way these animals look, the morphology is very different. Um, transients are kind of recognizable by seeing small groups. It can be a lone male that can be sighted, similar to um, if most of you know who T49C is, that might not ring a bell, but there's a male that seems to spend a lot of time in around Coos Bay, um, up in Tillamook. Uh, he's always looking for seals. Uh, these guys are mammal hunting specialists. So they live in coordinated groups of between one animal, as mentioned, to up to 12. Um, and they're they're very much on the lookout for anything warm-blooded. Uh, so that's seals, sea lions, porpoises, and small whales. Um, and then the last ecotype here that we have um, which if you're a tuna fisherman or if you're a, a fisherman working offshore, you might have an opportunity to see them. These are the, the offshore killer whales, which um, uh, we don't really know a lot about them, uh, but they form groups between uh, anywhere between 10 to over 100 animals. Um, and they're known to feed predominantly on uh, fish species, but in particular, much higher trophic or higher food web species like sharks. Um, but what's the most interesting thing about these three populations is the differences in diet, fish, telos species, marine mammals, and larger fish species, but that they don't interbreed or mix. Uh, all three populations um, form their own communities that don't intermix or, um, or, or breed. And you can see the differences uh, based on the social isolation um, and reproductive isolation in their, in their morphology. So resident killer whales are kind of recognized by this very rounded dorsal fin. Uh, and this gray area called the saddle patch can be either open with black pigments that kind of enter or it can be closed where, and this is a closed saddle patch here in the transient, uh, which is just all gray. 
Um, transients, on the other hand, have a very pointed dorsal fin, um, typically very shark-like, and this is predominant in adult females, uh, sometimes a, a bulge right in the front area of the dorsal fin, but their saddle patches are always closed. We've never seen a transient killer whale with an open saddle patch. Um, offshores, though, are kind of a mix. Uh, their body size in general is quite a bit smaller than the residents and transients, but they've been known to have either open saddle patches similar to the residents or closed saddle patches um, similar to transients. Um, but all three are what we call sympatric, occurring in the same waters or the same ecosystem, uh, but with a little bit of differences in where they seem to spend their time, depending on the prey species. But today I'm going to kind of focus on transient killer whales, and I'm going to spend my time talking about two regions which our research team is very interested in, and that's the Oregon coast um, as well as the California coast. Um, two very productive areas, but transient killer whales are found pretty much throughout the Northeastern Pacific, all the way from Southern California, all the way up into the Bering Sea and around the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. Um, and in, similar to the residents, where you have a Southern resident and a Northern resident population, we have multiple populations of transient. Um, so for instance, the Gulf of Alaska transients in the yellow here are a population that are predominantly seen throughout the Gulf of Alaska um, in Prince William Sound, along the Aleutian Islands and into the Bering Sea, but also even down into Northern British Columbia, there's been a few sightings. Uh, so all three, all these populations here um, are genetically distinct as well as acoustically, um, and um, they don't intermix for the most part. Uh, this dark, blue, this kind of blue um, AT1 transients and this little dot right here is a very unique population that was discovered in 1984. Um, the AT1 transients, or what we also call them the Chugash transients, um, are only found in Prince William Sound. And in 1984, when discovered, they numbered 22 whales. Um, but uh, after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, their population dropped to 13, um, and now they're down to seven with no reproductive female. So that population right now is critically depleted under the Endangered Species Act and will likely go extinct. Um, the other populations, though, we have the one that's the, the best or the most well-known uh, population that occurs along the Oregon coast in California is uh, what we call the West Coast transients in the purple here and the green. Um, this population forms from Southeast Alaska all the way down into British Columbia, along the outer coast of Washington, Oregon, and down to California. And a lot of the research we're looking into now, even though these are the best known, they're also the least known. We're starting to learn new things about their distribution, uh, potential subpopulations or, or communities inside the West Coast transients that are that are, depend, are independent and have their own ha habitats and characteristics. And that's a lot of the research I've been focusing on. Um, so just to kind of uh, show you here, we have what we believe to be a coastal and outer coast assemblage or subpopulation. Uh, so a bunch of the research I've been conducting looks into this. Um, we have a coastal group uh, that spends most of its time near the coast um, in reef areas where there's reefs, uh, along the continental shelf margins, so areas where it's shallow water, um, in inlets. They, these are a lot of the transients we see along the coast of Oregon uh, during the spring months. Um, that are that are predominantly eating harbor seal um, as well as sea lion, but we also have another group called what we believe called the outer coast, um, and this group we see most often um, near in the California waters or offshore of Oregon. A lot of our sightings have are from, and they are predominantly near the the continental shelf break, which is. Uh, runs offshore just close to the open ocean uh, where the continental sh shelf dips off and 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 goes out all, all, along the the abyssal the abyssal depths. This is data that we plotted showing uh, the distribution of sightings that we've collected for the West Coast population. And I just want to throw a thank you out to the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve, as well as uh, the, a lot of the Oregon community, because for a long time, the Oregon coast here has been kind of a dead zone for sightings. Um, there hasn't been a lot of reports coming in, and that became kind of an issue when we were trying to understand the overall distribution of how transient killer whales use the area, especially between these two kind of subpopulations. Uh, so for instance, off Vancouver Island here, uh, we see a predominant, um, there's a lot of sighting networks, a lot of whale watching activity in the Salish Sea. Uh, and you, in the blue dots here, you can see those are these inner coast or coastal transients that are found predominantly in here. Um, and then also you can see in the red here, the red dots, are predominantly outer coast. And you can see they're much more distributed closer to the shelf break. Um, and as the continental shelf, this is the shelf right here, you can see kind of running down the coast. It's quite wide off of Vancouver Island and outer coast of Washington and Oregon. But as you head south, 
you start to get, it starts to narrow and right into Monterey, California, which is right here, that shelf break comes right into about five kilometers of uh, shore um, at Moss Landing. And this is where we see a lot of the outer coast population is in these red dots in here. So they like deeper water uh, farther from shore. Um, but both of these, what makes it even more complex is that even though they're spatially distinct, we see more outer coast um, uh, latitudinally south of, uh, you know, of central Oregon down to uh, California, they do intermix occasionally. Um, and we do see kind of um, individuals from the inner coast and outer coast in each other's habitat. But we're still kind of learning about how these animals um, interact with each other. So kind of my interest for um, is uh, about where my interest in killer whales, especially from the California and Oregon region came from, was that we knew so much about killer whales in, around the Salish Sea, Vancouver Island, um, but we really didn't know a lot about what was happening in Oregon or California. And in 2009, while I was on a, a trip, um, to a field survey, I encountered a group of local intercoast transients that we knew quite well. They had recently killed um, a California sea lion and they were feeding on it. I got a report from a fisherman uh, not too long ago uh, that wasn't too far away. And he said there was a big group of killer whales that were coming our way, about 25 of them. And that was pretty exciting because we initially thought it potentially was the southern residents that were moving their way in through Juan de Fuca Strait, uh, which is a, a body of water that separates Vancouver Island from the U.S. Washington. And what we found was that when the group showed up, it was actually a, um, a large pod of transients. Uh, so we were shocked. There was actually over 40 of them. It was the largest group we had ever seen. And uh, we were photographing away and they, they were socializing. Um, and this particular male that you can see in the photograph here, male killer whales get this characteristic large dorsal fin when they hit sexual maturity uh, around 15 years of age. Um, and this grows until at, when they're adults, about 20, 21 years of age. But this large male was not recognizable. And as a research scientist, um, how we recognize killer whales are through photographs that are shared with our research team. And you can kind of see uh, this notch here. Um, this is um, particular to this individual. It's an injury that happened at some point, and that notch stays with this animal its entire life. So this male was unique. We had never seen him before. Uh, so our research team took photographs of him and another female um, that we didn't know who that we also didn't recognize. And it took us two months to find out that they were individuals that were most commonly seen off the central California coast. So that kind of just it, it really excited me and, and um, I wanted to figure out more about them. So we ended up talking with a, a nonprofit organization in Monterey uh, called Marine Life Studies. And I teamed up with them as the research coordinator and we decided to uh, try to do a complete census um, of the killer whales in that region or a study of them. Um, so I set off on an adventure. Two main study areas was the California coast and the Oregon coast. And we set up a set up a pretty interesting study. We went, went, went down the coast. We visited locals in the Oregon area um, as well as in California. We talked to naturalists. You can rec you probably recognize this whale watching center here in Depot Bay. Um, it's a great spot to, to watch gray whales as well as a lot of where um, killer whales are sighted in the spring. We've got quite a few sightings um, in the in the Oregon areas in Depot Bay. Um, but then also we talked to um, and collaborated with NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, and, and coordinated sightings with them as well on killer whales being seen. So this was a bit of an adventure, a bit of a road trip down the coast. Um, but then finally, as we got to Monterey, California, where we based our studies, we, um, we teamed up with this research group called Marine Life Studies. Um, and we had some pretty great time. We used to, between 2015 and 2020, we conducted a very, very... Um, um, extensive study looking at uh, the behavior of transient killer whales, which I'll share some information, but we have naturalists that were on board, uh, biologists, and that we work together to collect this data over this long period of time. So what did we find? So first I want to want to talk a little bit about the Oregon coast and, and killer whales. Um, and it's really exciting kind of what we're learning. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was a bit of a dead zone when it came to sightings. A lot of people, a lot of scientists are focused on gray whales off Oregon because they're just so much more uh, prevalent and um, accessible. There's there's quite a few that are resident to the area, but killer whales are kind of harder to find. And a couple of reasons for that. 
One being the weather off Oregon can be quite rough. It can be quite difficult to find animals, especially with the big open ocean. Um, their killer whales are a lot smaller, smaller than gray whales, and they typically um, move through the area um, quite quickly, and they don't linger for too long. Uh, the other re reason, though, is that there hasn't been really any dedicated research on killer whales off Oregon, and a lot of uh, local Oregon uh, people often collect information, but it might stay or, or sightings, and but it might stay in their private database because there's nowhere really to share that information. So in 2021, we formed um, a social media citizen science initiative to collect sightings of killer whales and. And we call it the Oregon Coast Killer Whale Sightings Group, which is part of our Oceanic Ecology Group research project. Um, and it's been very successful. Uh, we've been able to collect hundreds of sightings, not just recent sightings of killer whales, um, but also historical photographs that people like fishermen, um, uh, naturalists, park rangers have, have encountered, have sent in. And we've been able to really... Um, uh, We've been really, really able to open up the area of Oregon and connect it to the rest of the, the region of study that uh, we've been looking at the distribution of that West Coast population. So this outer coast is a lot more difficult to survey, but we're we're learning more about it. And uh, I can tell you right now, the group is up to 7.8 thousand Oregon locals, which is the group is, is strictly for people that are in Oregon that have the opportunity to, to see whales on a daily basis. And we're learning so much more. But the first historical studies of killer whales along the outer coast um, really kind of spiked my attention when I looked at the literature. Uh, this was a paper published in, in 1990 um, by Green et al. And it was a report that looked at the abundances of um, marine life, in particular gray whales, marine mammals, and uh, particularly gray whales along the outer coast of Washington and Oregon. Um, so it was focused on gray whales, but it had many other species. And this was based off aerial surveys through airplanes that collected sightings. Um, and what you can see here is killer whales. Um, the number 24, um, you can see uh, there was a, quite a few animals, but none were known. And in this report, they, they, they was collaborated by scientists that were studying killer whales in the inland Sea of the Sea. Most of the individual killer whales that were being cited were not able to be matched through the photo ID process uh, to individuals that were known. So these were unknown animals. So, but unfortunately, that information um, never was really known about if they were offshores, if they were transient, if they were resident. Um, so that was kind of the gist of what has been really published on killer whales. So that was another reason why this was so important for our work to, to start up and really kind of focus on the Oregon areas so to try to bridge these gaps. So what have we found? Uh, so here's a, 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 a spatial map um, looking at the number of sightings of killer whales along the Oregon coast. Uh, and that's 97 sightings from 2008 to 2021. And that's actually quite a bit in particular when we're looking at um, the, the most recent. In 2021, actually, 2022, we've had an up an, a, an increase of around 50 animals, uh, 50 sightings, uh, which is even more exciting. I think that's a lot of the fact that we're, our effort is increased with the, with the ability for these sighting groups to form. Uh, as you can see here, though, um, they're separated on different kinds of killer, different populations of killer whales. So we have this unknown here where uh, people have sent, it, uh, sent in a report, but weren't able to get photographs. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to positively identify. We just know that there was killer whales sighted. That information is still important as it enables us to look at um, presence data that we know that killer whales were in the area, um, which is important. It shows some sort of habitat use. Um, but we also have animals that we were able to identify, which is the most important form of data, um, which is photographs that we've been identified on that dorsal fin and saddle patch, which is unique to each animal. So the coastal group here in red are those intercoast or coastal transients. And you can see they're really focused along the coast here. They go right into areas like the, the canals and along the jetties off of Newport and Florence. And we get a lot of sightings where they're searching for seals. They'll go way up and even up into Coos Bay, up into the river there. Um, and then we have um, the outer coast, which I mentioned, uh, which are yellow. You can kind of see they're more spatial. The distributors, not as many, but that could be just effort related where we don't have a lot of people that are actually out here along this shelf searching. So we are likely not getting a lot of sightings that are out here. Um, so the more important that we, we collaborate with the fishing community and uh, pelagic birders that might be out there um, doing surveys. And then we have this blue dot here. 
And I'll explain a little bit about that in a further a couple of further slides down. But this is an important, we call these uh, these killer whales that we're seeing now your oceanics. They're mostly seen seaward of the, shelf, the um, continental shelf break here, further offshore. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a few slides. So this is kind of the, the coast broken up into two halves, uh, more of northern Oregon and uh, in central Oregon here, and then the southern Oregon coast here, uh, with how those same sightings are kind of distributed. Um, but you can tell that there's, there's a lot of effort in certain areas, like more sightings occur in Coos Bay or Depot Bay, um, you know, Otter Rock area down in Newport. And this is majority where the majority of the population live on the Oregon coast or in these areas uh, and where a lot of the whale watching effort is. But likely that we're missing um, some of the sightings that are occurring uh, along these other stretches of the coast. But the encounters with killer whales have involved group sizes, um, and these are mostly just for the transient killer whales. Um, we've been seeing groups of about four to five individuals on average, um, and that's typical for transient killer whale groups that we see. Uh, but we also see down here even larger groups of 25. So this is group size along the x-axis and then on the y-axis number of sightings. Um, and you can kind of see sometimes we do get large groups that do form of, of killer whales. Uh, so there's a photograph from our colleague Lee Torres at Oregon State University. This is T49C. I mentioned him earlier. He's kind of a local favorite for quite a few people that have got to know him. Uh, you can kind of see his two notches here that are characteristic for him. He's This was just outside Newport. <clears throat> he was moving his way in through to the jetty looking for seals. Um, but how we identify killer whales, I'll explain in a few slides as well. Um, but this is, a, this is his number and his name. So why are we seeing so many killer whales? This is a question that I've been getting asked by a lot of people that are following our research along the coast. Why are we seeing so much? Is it increasing? Why are people, you know, particularly the last year, people have been asking, oh man, is it, Josh, have we seen more killer whales? Is there, is there a reason for it? There's a couple of possible hypotheses that we're looking into. One of them being, as I already mentioned, it could be effort related. More people are looking, more people are reporting. They have a sighting network to report these sightings to. Um, and that could be one reason. Um, the other reason could be that we're seeing a shift in the prey population. And as mentioned, the coastal transient group uh, has increased over the years, but they are mammal hunters and their main prey are what we call harbor seals. Uh, they also forage on sea lions and porpoise, but harbor seal is really the species that has driven the population growth over the last few decades, especially in the waters around southern Vancouver Island. But harbor seals um, have this climb along the coast. So the blue shades on this map we created show the differences in when the pupping season occurs. So early studies in the 1990s really highlighted um, transient killer whale occurrence or when they show up, uh, that it was related to the harbor seal pupping season in the waters of southern Vancouver Island, the U.S. Uh, San Juan Islands. And that peak in the season was around uh, between August and September. And transient killer whale increased our time in there. Well, what we're learning about the Oregon coast is that most of our sightings of transient killer whales have been through basically March through May. And that is also around the same time that we're starting to see the pups being born off the Oregon coast. So, and with the increase in um, the sightings that we've been getting and people learning about how to photograph killer whales so that we can get the ideas of animals, we're learning that some of the groups that we're seeing off Oregon kind of shift their distribution along the coast up into the areas of Southern Vancouver Island, timing this difference in their movements between Oregon and British Columbia. So there could be a climb also in the killer whales following their harbor seal pupping season, but we're kind of still in the infancy of this research, trying to learn a little bit more about it. But as you can see here in this, this graph on the x-axis, here's the month, and then the y-axis is the number of sightings. And you can see in May and June is kind of the height of when we start to see um, pups being born, or uh, sorry, killer whales being sighted. And that's, as I go back, you can kind of see that's during this period of time where harbor seals are being born off the Oregon coast. So we're kind of working on trying to correlate this to understand if there is some sort of relationship between harbor seals and killer whales, similar to what has been studied with the population on, of southern Vancouver Island. Um, to do this, though, we've kind of been teaming up with um, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, who are, are is responsible for managing and um, assessing the harbor seal population, as well as other pinniped species. Um, as you can see here, it's the same map uh, on the left here with 
uh, the killermost sightings, but on the right here is the locations of where harbor seal hollowed. So a hollowed is where it's a rocky substrate similar to like a reef. It could be a cobble beach. It could be um, on a log boom. It's an area where seals will come out to rest, give birth, or molt, which is getting rid of their fur. Uh, and you can see in a concentration, sometimes between 10 to over 100 animals, but you can see harbor seals, areas where harbor seals seem to to use their spend their time, which kind of overlaps here with a lot of where we see the killer whale sightings, especially for the coastal transients. And as we kind of look at this, this is a heat map um, looking at these sightings again, but also looking at the heat air, heated areas of where we see the, the greatest abundance of harbor seals as this, the, where the heat is. So there's high abundance is the lighter colors where the, the cooler colors are uh, less abundance, but you can kind of see here, especially in areas where it's kind of medium to high, we see a lot of killer whale occurrence. And, and, and most of these gray unknowns are likely transients we know. So foraging behavior for transients, especially the inner coasts, they spend a lot of time in quite shallow water. So if you're looking out over the ocean, the open ocean off the Oregon coast, and you see these little islets or these little small ocean islands, there's chances you may find killer whales searching here. This is an area where harbor seals will haul out, as mentioned, on these little reefs or on these rocks. And killer whales will come right into the kelp bed searching, sometimes in the water that's only five to six feet deep. It's, uh, it's not surprising that we see them. So this is kind of a family of transients that are coordinating their hunting, looking for seals in this area. Um, and here's a small video clip that was shared by a fisherman um, off of, um, I think it was off of Coos Bay that encountered some transients hunting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can kind of see a sea lion up here trying to get out of the water, but you can see the real close following contours of the land, um, hoping that they'll find a seal that's that's in there. So the next part of this talk I want to quickly go over is the photo identification process. Uh, so the, one of the big steps was trying to understand, as mentioned, what is the killer whale population, like the outer coast killer whales that are less known um, compared to the inner coast, what was their population really looking like? And um, and what was the population, what is the population like off Oregon in California? So how we do that is we take a photograph or we look at photographs sent in from the public or from the community. And this is the dorsal fin here. And you can see the saddle patch, these scars. These congenital features are unique to every killer whale in the population and they don't change. And even the shape of the fin, you can kind of see here this male, this fin kind of goes up in here. This animal, this these features stay with the animal for, throughout its life. So we, we census or catalog every single whale. And we do this through a few different methods, one from the general public, but from some of our own work where we did opportunistic surveys off the California coast in Monterey, uh, but also from our collaboration with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration through ship-based surveys offshore to really access some of those areas where we can't get a lot of information, uh, but also through whale watchers that, um, and naturalists who take photographs during expeditions. We've been, really, we've, been, we've been able to really collect and consolidate quite a bit of data. And our study area was quite large. You can see here on the left map, it extended from Point Conception, California, out to about 560 kilometers offshore, well west of the continental shelf break, all the way up to Astoria, Oregon. And then over here, you can see is the different sightings. So this is Monterey, which is one of our, our main uh, centers of operation. Uh, but we're proud to say now we're kind of focusing a lot of our attention in Newport as well. And, and in future studies will be in Newport, Oregon, as well as Monterey. And you can kind of see here the differences in, in uh, um, uh, the differences in effort in types of organizations that collected these sightings. But it's not fun and games going out there all the time and taking photographs and watching whales. Most of our actual work involves sitting behind a computer. Um, and for the photo ID effort we worked on from 2006 to 2018, this is what our, our photo ID study was focused on that time period. We had to analyze hundreds of thousands of over 100,000 photographs photographs, as well as spend countless hours looking through emails of people sending in images. Um, and Moss Landing Marine Laboratories here in Monterey was very kind enough to <clears throat> lend us and donate their time at their library, as well as their equipment for us to sit and actually look through um, this large database. So what do we find? So transient killers were, were photographed and uh, photographs were retained from 2006 to 2018. We had over 146 encounters or opportunities to collect information on killer whales. 
We looked at 113,127 photographs uh, and analyzed those. Uh, and then we found a total of 150 individuals uh, in the outer coast transient population that were distinct from any of the individuals typically found in coastal waters. And this encompassed 30 matrilineal groups or families comprising a mother and her offspring. So you can see here, this is how we identified an animal. We, this is a female we know as Emma or OCT30. She has these two unique marks right here. She's no, quite well known off the California coast, but has also been sighted off Oregon. Uh, we can identify her based on just this alone, but we can also um, identify her off her eye patch. This is the postocular patch at the top. Her eye would sit just behind here. But we give each animal an identifier. So OCT literally means outer coast transient. And then the number 30 is her, um, her number. So for instance, here we go. OCT 30 is the, is the female here, the leader of the matriline, her family. If she has an offspring, her first offspring would be OCT 30 B or A. And her second offspring would be OCT 30 B and C and so on. Now, if her offspring had an offspring, it would be B1. So it would be the first offspring. So her grand uh, granddaughter or grandson would be given the B1 and B2, B3, et cetera. And we can do this for every single family as we get to know them um, over multiple encounters. So what did we find? We found that throughout our study, there was an increase in the number of individuals identified. Uh, and this is both through births of new calves, as well as new individuals being identified from previous that have not been previously recorded in our study or published information. And this is what a family looks like. So you can see here's the mother. This is OCT30. Um, and then her first, her second offspring, her first offspring died. So the second offspring would be B, her two grandchildren, B1 and B2, her first son, OCT30C, her presumed brother, as you can see the dashed line here, uh, means presumed. Um, we believe this is her brother, 60. And then her fourth offspring, D. And now she actually has one more. And we know this group is the gray killers. They're very common. They're, they're, they're very commonly seen um, or encountered hunting gray whale calves in Monterey, California. And this is over the time period of this one individual we knew, OCT44C. So it's so important when we get these photographs from the public that we can identify these whales because we can kind of track their life. Um, in particular, this animal here was quite young in 2006 when we first photographed it. And over time, you can see it acquired a notch here. Uh, and then down here, it kind of started to grow bigger. And then in 2014, it started to sprout this dorsal fin. And then you, over time, you can kind of see to being a full adult male here uh, that has sprouted and is sexually mature and physically mature. So I mentioned the oceanic population. So this is what's really interesting is that through this study, we found killer whales that were unique in the fact that they were not able, we weren't able to match them through association to other known transient killer whales, or um, they were never seen in coastal waters. So we really don't know what they are. But most of these encounters happen seaward of the continental shelf, far offshore up to three, sometimes up to 370 kilometers. Uh, and you can see here, this is an animal far offshore of Monterey Bay. And this one was actually 370 kilometers away. It was feeding on a pygmy sperm whale. But all the encounters that we've had um, have been with them eating marine mammals. Uh, and most of this work has been done by NOAA Southwest Fisheries Science Center, who we collaborate with. Um, and you can see these, there's albatrosses out here that were feeding on the carcass, but we really don't know where these animals fit in. So here's an animal, a large male here. And it was, we've had a total of 40, in, we, we have a total of 40 of these animals identified between 1997 and 2021 through data we've either had from encounters or through consolidation or collection. We have no links between them and known outer coast transients or any killer whale uh, that we know of. Uh, found predominantly seaward of the continental shelf, so far offshore. Um, encountered feeding on marine mammals similar to transients. Um, also, they had this unique thing called the presence of cookie cutter sharks. And as you can see here on the saddle patch right here, you can see these bite marks. Some of them are older, more white. Some of them are uh, black. Uh, but there's fresh ones too where the adipose tissue or the epidermal skin has been broken. And you can see the actual pink tissue here. Um, and these are caused by this shark species called a cookie cutter shark. And what's unique about this is that <clears throat> these marks are only found on animals that spend time in offshore waters. These sharks in general are deep water pelagic species 
that only feed in warm offshore waters. So it really shows a little bit of a, an indirect uh, presence of these animals in far open ocean habitats. So the end of this, we published in 2021, a new catalog for transient killer whales off the central and Northern California and Oregon coast. So this is freely available at the NOAA website. You can always email me, but you can also find it on the website. It has all the individuals that we photo identified uh, throughout that entire study. Um, we were very happy about this. We'll be updating it every couple of years. Um, and we're gonna, and especially as we start to learn more about killer whales of Oregon and California. <clears throat> So one of our main, uh, the third thing I would like to talk about is our behavior study. Um, this is kind of where I focus a lot of my attention is animal behavior. So why study behavior? Well, animal behavior lets us understand um, how animals interact with their environment as well as each other. How top predators such as killer whales may influence their habitat. Uh, and some of our objectives were to provide information on the predatory role of transient killer whales in Monterey Bay, California, uh, but we're also extending this to the Oregon coast. And this includes defining their behavior as well as the type of prey that they're eating. And this is getting more and more important, especially off the Oregon coast with, uh, with seals and sea lions, which are interacting with fisheries, understanding how killer whales may be part of this ecosystem and how they may affect the prey populations is an important aspect and critical for understanding fisheries management. We also wanted to develop an activity budget. So an activity budget is a behavioral budget where we look at what killer whales are doing, what kind of behavior, what kind of percentages of each behavior are being used by these animals. It can help with e uh, developing ecological models for understanding habitat as well as physiology, which is like energetics. Um, but we also want to provide information on seasonal occurrence, the types of prey and the habitat use patterns. So what do we do? We used observational methods. This is Monterey Bay here, a much more up close in, uh, for, um, map. But the most distinguishing feature of the bay is this big canyon. It comes all the way into shore. As I mentioned, this continental shelf narrows and comes right in. And this is the submarine canyon. Uh, we used, um, once again, we used uh, opportunistic encounters, the NOAA fisheries science surveys, as well as whale watching to try to help get sightings. Um, but one of the big be, uh, methodologies we used was focal follows. A focal follow is where you con you're constantly following um, an animal or a group of animals and you're collecting behavioral data systematically. So you're collecting information on a time basis where say every five minutes you take a location of where that animal is seen, what it was doing, um, and what the group was doing. And we did this for this population. Um, every few minutes, we'd take a location uh, using a G GIS, using latitude, longitude, um, as well as identification of the animals and, and what predominant behaviors. So if they were how the distance between individuals, how long dives were, the respirations, what they were feeding on, how far apart they were, um, this was all important for defining specific activity states or behaviors. Um, this is kind of gruesome. This is the most gruesome photo you'll see, but this is, uh, we also was important to identify prey. Um, and this often in, involved being close up. Um, and in California, especially off the outer coast of central California, we saw a lot of gray whale calf predations in the spring in March and April, uh, where the outer coast transients send, seem to spend a lot of time. This is a photograph here of a gray whale calf being attacked. Um, this is a carcass of a gray whale um, and often being able to define the amount of tissue and blubber in the water, um, if there was birds present, <clears throat> and how killer whales coordinate and how they share prey is also very important. Uh, our results from this study, one, we had um, close, we had over 260 encounters for this study, um, uh, for, but 100 encounters, 260 sightings, 100 encounters uh, with transient killer whales. And this heat map here, you can see uh, our colleague Kevin Lester um, shows kind of where transient killer whales were in our encounters were predominantly found, which is along this canyon area um, where they seem to ambush gray whales as they migrate up the coastline. So as gray whales head north from uh, the warm lagoons in Mexico, they kind of hug this coast. Um, and then as they cut across the bay, you'll see that they sometimes hug around here and they'll kind of cut like this and then kind of go up because they're heading north up to Oregon. We're starting to learn though gray whales might also be being killed off the Oregon coast. Um, it's something that we're, that we're still investigating. But we defined activity states. So foraging was the number one activity state. And that involved a couple of different types of foraging or sub behaviors, one being what we call shelf breaks, so canyon foraging. Uh, and that's right down here in this panel where killer whales follow the edge of the canyon, sometimes crossing it, um, searching for prey along areas where a lot of upwelling and nutrients are found. 
this is a brand new kind of behavior that has not been quantified before. Uh, so we actually came up with this term here. Um, also open water foraging, which is on the other panel here, which is different. Individual whales typically spread out over a kilometer uh, and often do this zigzagging behavior where it's kind of long dive, five to six minute dives where they zigzag all over the place. A uh, prey pursuit is when they're actively actually attacking an animal. Uh, feeding behavior when they're feeding, um, that was also how long they fed um, was important. We also had traveling, which you can see up here is when they're actually cutting across the can cutting across an area in a linear direction. Um, and you, this is feeding up here where it's very stationary. Um, so our animal, our ability to um, plot where we were was within 50 meters of whales with our research vessel. So we can kind of see their movements uh, was similar to where our boat track was. And then we also had socializing as, as well as resting. Uh, but you can see the percentages here of the different kinds of behavior. One, shelf break searching, um, which I said that canyon searching was 26.1% of the time in Monterey was spent uh, utilizing this behavior. 24.7% for open water searching. And then resting was one of the, the least uh, behaviors. And this behavior was then compared to other activity budgets that have been formed for transients. And we found a very similar trend. Um, and this, these results from this are, are we're currently publishing. A uh, diet consisted of the predominant California sea lion and gray whale calves. But in the spring, this was what we saw. 33% was California sea lion. 30% uh, was gray whale calf. And then less than 10% were a number of other species from harbor seal, uh, northern elephant seal, um, down to minke whale. But then the rest of the year, we see California sea lion dominated. Uh, gray whale calves are already during the summer, fall, and winter either um, up in the feeding grounds in the Bering Sea or off Oregon or the Pacific feeding group population, or they're making their way back down the coast. But we don't have any predation events for gray whale calves outside that period. Um, seasonality for transients was bimodally distributed. So similar to Oregon in California, we see kind of a, a large spike in sightings in April and May in June, um, and then less in July, as we believe the killer whales may follow gray whales north. And you can see here kind of in fall. So to really dive into this relationship of killer whale gray whales, we had to really understand the ecology of both and a bit about, about the numbers of each that were happening. So gray whales, as I mentioned, this is off Big Sur, California. They migrate up the coast in the springtime. Calves are born in the lagoons, the tropical, tropical lagoons, and they go north with their mother in April and May. Um, so as they head up the coast, though, um, their NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center actually conducts um, a, a census for gray whale calves. Um, off Point Pedras Blanca, which is a light station, and they count the calves, and it's only about 100 kilometers south of Monterey, California. So we were able to take this data uh, that they contributed to this study and apply it to uh, some of the results that we have. And you can kind of see here, this is a gray whale calf count, is the orange. Uh, so the number of calves, and calves are only counted between March and in, in May. Uh, and there's zero counts because by that time, they're or the calves are already headed north. So this is kind of that spike. But transient killer whale group size, you can see here, also kind of spiked uh, for the number of transient killer whales that were seen, the number of groups that we were seen, but also the occurrence of transient killer whales, uh, which you can see here, that occurrence is the number of times killer whales were seen, and you can see a, a similar spike. And this was also statistically significant in our study. Um, finally, um, we're stoked uh, to have a brand new publication coming out in 2022 uh, dedicated to transient killer whales. It's a field guide for naturalists and people that are just interested in killer whales. It's non-technical. It's more of a natural history guide um, that's been produced by NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center for California. And we're currently in the process of building one for Oregon as well. Uh, so this will be available online for free. And we'll have an Oregon one hopefully up in the next uh, year or so where I'm currently writing. So it's pretty exciting because we're, as I mentioned, with the increase in our Oregon efforts, we're in with the, the, the amazing community in Oregon, we're learning so much more about killer whales. Um, I just would like to acknowledge there's so many people that I'd like to acknowledge the entire Oregon community. Um, you guys are all so amazing. Um, you, this wouldn't be possible without the, the multiple people that are just out there providing photographs and sharing, uh, as well as organizations like the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. Um, as well as Oregon Coast Aquarium, um, Seaside Aquarium, uh, NOAA Fisheries, as well as Oregon State University, who we collaborate with quite a bit. And in California, we, that can be, wouldn't be possible without the Marine National Marine Sanctuaries, uh, Marine Life Studies, as well as 
um, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories and Discovery Whale Watch. But I just want to thank the Cape Perpetual for letting me speak today. And um, it was it was awesome talking to everybody. Thank you.